All right, hello everybody. So welcome to our first official lesson here in our first unit, uh, Industrialization and Immigration. Uh, our first lesson here is called A New Industrial Age. So our objectives and standards uh, to analyze the factors that encouraged industrialization in the United States in the late 1800s and to understand the growth and spread of industry throughout the United States in the late 1800s. And just take a moment there to read the standards, if you would, please. And our desired result. How did the second industrial revolution begin in the United States? <clears throat> so the growth of American industry. In the 1700s, the British, British textile industry had set off the industrial revolution. And eventually, the industrial revolution is going to spread to other European countries and eventually the United States. Um, the event, the industrial revolution um, to remind you, uh, involved a lot of machinery, uh, steam power, and things like that, and pretty much changed a lot of countries, including the U.S., uh, from a lot of agriculture-based work to industry and factory work. So resources within the United States allowed for the expansion of industry that was growing in the U.S., um, especially coal and iron, and we're going to talk about uh, coal and iron and its impact on the growing industry in the United States in the late 1800s coming up here soon. So the Industrial Revolution is going to enter a new stage around the 1850s. Oil, steel, and eventually electricity are going to become the new sources of power instead of steam. So we'll begin to see oil and steel and, like we said, eventually electricity become very powerful um, and begin to grow and spread across the country. So the Civil War causes changes. Industries were challenged to make goods more quickly and efficiently during the Civil War, especially in the North. The North was already industrial based. While the South was more farming and agriculture, the North was more industry and factories and commerce. So especially in the North, um, we're going to see a lot of industry grow and begin to spread, especially in those Northern states. Factories stepped up productions of guns, ammunition, uniforms, medical supplies, and food during the war. And methods were also improved to ship food long distances. Obviously, if you need to send food to soldiers in Tennessee from Philadelphia, um, we're going to see different methods and different strategies used to improve sending you know, food and supplies to soldiers um, more efficiently. One of the ways that this is going to improve is improvements with railroads to make them more efficient. Uh, railroads were kind of one of the main ways to travel uh, in the late 1800s, middle 1800s. Um, so railroads are also going to change to make them more efficient as well. Another thing that's going to change, and we'll talk later about this much more uh, in the unit, but immigration is going to be encouraged by the government in order to meet demands of labor to work in factories, to work in industries, as these growing factories and industries are spreading across the country. So economic development in natural resources. So just a reminder, when we talk about natural resources, we're talking about things um, that come naturally from the earth, things like oil, coal, um, iron, uh, you know, things that we find in the earth. So the United States does have a vast supply of natural resources, um, and during this time, it's going to help the country grow economically. One of the main um, natural resources that are going to come about, especially in the late 1800s, are coal mines. Coal mines are going to be used <laughs> excuse me, to power locomotives, which are trains, and also factories. So we're going to see a rising growth of coal mines. We're also going to see a, a lot of forests will be cut down for lumber, for construction. Um, unfortunately, that's going to have a big negative effect on the environment, but um, we'll see later on when we, in the class how that's going to, uh, forests will eventually begin to be protected as well. We'll also see a lot of buildings and bridges uh, begin being constructed from iron and steel. So the power of oil. 
Edwin Drake, you can see his picture there, used a steam engine to drill the first successful oil well near Titusville, Pennsylvania. Maybe some of you are located near there, maybe you've heard of this, um, but in Titusville, Pennsylvania um, is the first type of oil well ever uh, drilled, and that was done in 1859. Now, prior to oil drilling, whale blubber, or whale kind of fat, was used for oil, but whale hunting was time-consuming. Obviously, people have to go out in boats and find these whales, and it was also endangering whales. Um, whales were becoming very scarce, very limited, so people are aware that maybe, you know, something needs to change. Relatively cheap and easy to produce, Drilled oil started to become a main source of power, and soon after this, the oil industry will begin to grow along with kerosene, which kerosene was used to light like lamps in people's homes before electricity, and also gasoline. Gasoline will be used to power engines, uh, factory parts, industry parts, and things like that. So strength with steel. During the 1850s, another process is going to make it easier to turn iron ore, which we find in the earth, into steel. And large amounts of iron ore will be moved across the country to many steel making centers. And I'm sure many of you are from the western part of the state and maybe towards Pittsburgh. Um, but Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania became one of the major um, steel making centers of not just the country of the world in fact but pittsburgh pennsylvania will become a steel making center and that's why i put the uh, pittsburgh steelers symbol there that's why they're called that that's how the football team got their name was because there were a lot of steel mills in pittsburgh so if you're ever wondering how that, uh, the football team got their name that's uh, one of the reasons why so production of steel is going to lead to better railways for trains and better buildings. Um, and new railways will bring natural resources to eastern cities like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, wherever, uh, and those factories as well. So again, so new steel, making stronger and better railways, stronger and better buildings, stronger and building f be uh, better factories, um, which are going to bring more resources to make more things. Um, in these cities and other places. We're going to see a change in the workforce as well in the late 1800s. The growth of industry also is going to impact population changes. So following the war, following the Civil War, many Europeans and Asian immigrants are going to come to um, the United States. Uh, sorry about the typo there. Um, they came for different reasons, such as political problems in their own countries. Maybe they were being persecuted for religious reasons, political reasons, or maybe uh, they came to the United States to look for land or to make more money. Some people were out of jobs in their home countries and were looking for um, a way to make money. Um, and of course, with all these booming industries and booming factories, uh, they're going to come to the United States. By 1905, there were almost 1 million immigrants in the U.S., and they were willing to work for lower wages, and they were willing to move for economic opportunities. So factories and industries and these people who control these industries are going to go, hey, we can pay these immigrants you know, less money instead of you know, an American who may want more money. So these immigrants are willing to work for low wages, and many of them worked in dangerous situations without really questioning anything. Um, so these factories and industries are going to have a huge and willing workforce to use and basically exploit uh, to expand their own growth and their own profits. So enterprise and entrepreneurship. During the late 1800s, there was an idea that anyone could become rich if they worked hard. So a system of entrepreneurs or people who build and manage businesses or enterprises was born. Think about Shark Tank. They are entrepreneurs. They are taking their own money um, and investing it in businesses or ideas that people go on that show. So you've seen the show Shark Tank. The sharks, quote unquote, are entrepreneurs. So that's what people were doing in the late 1800s. They were taking their own money and risking it on businesses or ideas. Now, competition could be tough. Again, just like you've seen with Shark Tank, how they kind of fight with each other a little bit. Um, competition was tough, but entrepreneurs found ways to cut costs increase efficiency and eventually lower prices of items so everyday people could afford them. 
government policies are also going to support growth as well. Businesses were allowed to operate, <coughs> excuse me, under minimal government uh, regulation known as laissez-faire policies. Now, laissez-faire is a French term which practically means leave to do. In other words, let people and businesses decide what is best for them. The government shouldn't tell businesses and people how they should spend their money. Let the people decide what they should do with their money. Let the businesses and the industries decide how they should spend their money. And these policies are going to allow businesses and industry leaders to control and grow their investments. Now, that might sound great. You might say, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, sure. They can do what they want with their money. That's fine. But the problem is, is not all the time did business leaders or industry um, owners really take care of their, uh, their workers or care for their workers. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about um, the progressive era and the problems uh, with this as well. Because workplace conditions were challenging um, without any government regulation. But overall, laissez-faire policies are going to allow for entrepreneurs like Andrew Carnegie, um, or Carnegie, yeah, there's different ways to say that. Um, we'll talk more about him, one of the big business leaders of uh, the U.S. and of the world. Um, he definitely expanded his personal growth and um, industry uh, during the late 1800s. Um, so we'll talk about that. Protective tariffs or taxes were also used to raise the cost of goods from outside the United States. So a jar of peanut butter from Canada uh, would cost more than the jar of peanut butter made here in the U.S. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to buy the peanut butter here in the U.S. instead of the jar of peanut butter from Canada because it's less money. So that's also something else that's going on to help industry and factories grow as well. All right, so think about how the second industrial revolution began in the United States. Uh, we talked about how there's a change um, in the workforce with immigrants. We talked about how the Civil War kind of sparked or set off the second industrial revolution because of the needs of the Civil War. Um, talked about how industries and businesses are growing because of natural resources and some support from the government. So again, you're going to see this second industrial revolution kind of take off. So think about that when you're answering your questions, okay? So make sure to include uh, all, everything you need to in the chart in the weekly summary. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about that, please let me know. And I hope you have a great rest of your day or night, and I hope to talk to you soon.